Welcome, grade 12s. Yes, today's journey is about fixed assets, right? And also about cash flow and ratios. So remember, very often in an exam paper, you would find a combination of sections within one question. This is a perfect example of that, where within one question, you expect to do the fixed assets the cash flow, as well as the financial indicators or ratios. Okay, and as usual, we normally start off with an appetizer, right? A starter, and you are now expected to choose the correct answer in a statement that's given to you. And we'll start off with you having to choose the correct answer. You have one minute to do that. Go for it. Okay, grade 12s, let's see what you've got. The mortgage bond that you finance the purchase of a fixed asset is what? It's what we refer to as a non-current liability because by definition, it's going to be paid over a period greater than 12 months and therefore, it would be a non-current liability. Remembering that the current portion that you have to pay within 12 months would appear as your short-term loan or your current liability on the face of your balance sheet, right? The current portion of your loan, or sometimes referred to as a short-term loan, right? Distributable reserves, such as retained income, would form part of what? Certainly, they form part of shareholders' equity. In other words, shareholders' equity is made up of your ordinary share capital plus your retained income. The amount due by SARS, in respect of income tax, is what we refer to as a current asset, okay? SARS owes us the money, and therefore, whenever we're dealing with SARS income tax, the question that I always ask is, what type of an account is SARS income tax? And your answer is, it depends. In this case, it's a debit balance, therefore, a current asset. Right, and then finally, an investment such as a fixed deposit, uh, at 9% per annum, interest over five years will be shown as what? It will be shown as a financial asset. Why? Maturation period of greater than 12 months, that portion of the fixed deposit that's maturing within 12 months would appear as part of your current assets under cash and cash equivalents. Well, the starter is over. Let's get on to the, the next part of our question. It says here, Refer to information C, and you have to calculate the missing amounts denoted by A to D in the fixed assets note. All right, let's see if we can identify and get to that fixed assets note. And as soon as we get to that note, we can start calculating the missing figures. There goes. Number one is A, calculate your accumulated depreciation. Right. So obviously, if you've got your cost price and you've got your carrying value, certainly you can calculate your accumulated depreciation. And how do you do that? By simply doing this here, right? You take your cost price, which is 3,640,000, right? Minus your 2,002,000,
And that gives you, have I got my 2W2? And that's equal to 1,638,000. So what is that figure? That would be your accumulated depreciation. 1,638,000. Okay, what did we do? We took our cost price minus our carrying value. Obviously, that would give me my accumulated depreciation. Right, the next figure that you need to calculate is your disposal. Whenever you're calculating your disposal, what's important for you to take note of is the following. Always draw the table. Depreciation, cost price, accumulated depreciation, carrying value, selling price. Right, let's go back and see what information do we have regarding the disposal. We are told that Equipment is depreciated at 15% per, an, per annum on cost. On the 31st of August 2015, old equipment costing 750000 Immediately, I tell myself, I've got my cost price, 750000 Clear? Right. And what else do I know? I'm told that the accumulated depreciation on this equipment was 491750 on the 1st of May 2015. In other words, that's the beginning of your financial year. 491750. So, 491750. And immediately I put a plus sign alongside it. Why? Because I'm going to depreciate for pro rata for the balance of the year. That's my opening balance. 491750 is my opening balance. Okay, and what other information do I have? It was sold for cash at its carrying value. Once again, cash flow, we dispose of the asset at its carrying value. Right, now, immediately I know that I need to calculate my pro rata depreciation. For what period? For the period in this year, because remember, that's my carrying value at the beginning of my financial year. I'm disposing of the asset on the 31st of August 2015. So immediately I can see May, June, July, August. That gives you four months, right? So out with the calculator. And we say, fine. Let's take the information that we have here. What information do we have? Okay. It's 750,000 because it's the cost price. 750,000, right? Times 15% because that's my rate of depreciation. And that will give my depreciation for the year, right? Divided by 12 times that by the four months that I need to work out for, which is 37,500. Okay, if it's 37,500, that becomes my current depreciation of 37,500. I'm gonna add that to my accumulated depreciation, obviously, debit depreciation, credit accumulated depreciation, and therefore, I've got that plus 491, 750, and that gives me 529250. Okay? The total depreciation, let's put the calculator on this side here now, is equal to 529250. Okay, what do I do now? I now take my cost price, which was 750,000. Minus the 529250, and that will give me a figure of 220750. Right. 220750. Let's just verify if that figure is correct. 220750. That was my carrying value. Remember, when we're doing an asset disposal using 
or, or working within the ambits of the cash flow statements, we will always dispose of the asset at carrying value. Therefore, this figure here, your selling price will be 220-2-2-0-7-5-0, which tells me that that was the selling price of my asset. Now remember something else. The question said, we need to calculate, if we look at the information, we want our disposal, which is at carrying value, and there we got the figure of the carrying value, which is 220750. Now remember something, grade 12, so what's very important, is whenever you are doing an asset disposal, always make use of this table. As you can clearly see, that you can use given information and thereby arrive at your answer. Okay, the next amount that we need to calculate as per our question would be my depreciation for the year. Once again, break this up into your various components. What are they? Sold, which I've done already, and the sold depreciation amounted to 37,500. Right? I now need to work out the old depreciation. And what do I do in this case here? Step number one, take your cost price at the beginning of the year, which was 3,640,000. You see it? Right? Take the 3,640,000. Subtract the asset that you dispose of and it had a cost price of 750,000, okay? This means therefore that three million six hundred and forty thousand minus 750,000 will tell you the cost price of the vehicles or the equipment that you are left with. This gives you a figure of 2,890,000. Obviously, we're using art, amount, rate, and time. So my rate is 15 over 100 times my time. It's old. I had it for the entire year times 12 over 12. So immediately I say, take this figure times 15%. and it will give you a figure of 433,500. Right, that would be your depreciation on your old equipment. Right, did you purchase new equipment? Let's check it out. On the 1st of December 2015, new equipment valued at 900,000 Rand was purchased. Therefore, I now have new equipment. Let's sort out the new equipment, 900,000 times 15 over 100, which is my rate. Remember, amount, rate, and time. Now, for what period did I use the new equipment? It was bought on the, let's check it out. It was bought on the 1st of December, 2015. I know that my financial year end is The question before this will tell me, there's my, inf with the April of 2016, so immediately I know now, I need to work out from the 1st of December, so it's December, January, February, March, and April, five months, times five over 12, so once again, Let's get our calculator out there. Our figure is 900,000 times 15%. That's for the year, divided by 12 times five, and that will be amount of 56,250. Now remember this, all of these figures you would add to give you a depreciation for the year. What would it be? It would be 
the sold of 37,500, the unsold of 433,500, and the new. Remember, this is your new equipment at 56,250. So add these three components together, and that will then give you the total depreciation for the year. Well, guys, time to take a break. We, at the end of the whole first session, take a quick break, have a quick breather, and we'll see you in a while. Welcome back, grade 12s. Yes, we've calculated A, B, and C. The last one that we need to calculate is D, the cost price of your vehicles at the end of the year. So immediately, this is what you do. You start off with your 3,640,000. Let's do that. 3,640,000. That's my balance at the beginning of the year. Right. Did I dispose of an asset? Certainly I did. How much? 750,000. You recall the cost price of the vehicle that you disposed of. And did you purchase a new asset? Certainly you did. How much? 900,000. That then would give you your cost price of your vehicles at the end of the year. Once again, let's go for it. 3,640,123 minus 750,000 plus 900,000. Okay, and that equals to 3,790,000. That would be the figure that we needed at D. Okay, so that's our, our fixed assets note, done and dusted. Let's look at the next part of the question. What are we expected to calculate? We are expected to do, the question wants us to calculate, let's see, I think it's our calculate, the following amounts, income tax paid, right? And obviously, what is most important for you is to look at the information that is given to you with regards to your taxation, and this is how we're going to do it. Maybe we can just work on this page here, which will be fine. Okay, here goes. The easiest way to calculate your taxation paid, grade 12s, remember there are many methods, but the method that I have taught you and I find the easiest is to redraft your SARS income tax account. Okay, step number one. Let's see if you remember. In fact, maybe a good idea. Go for it, guys. You have one minute to draft this account for me based on the information that you have here in front of you, okay? In fact, let me just give you another part of information that you will require, right? It's your net profit before tax and your net profit after tax, that, that information here. So I'm, I'm actually leading you on, right? So you need that information as well as the SARS income tax this information here. Okay, now I need to give you both those figures. So what I'm going to do for you, I'm going to take the net profit before tax and put it here, net profit before tax, 1,279,000. Let's just check that out. 1,279,000 and 895 300. 895 300 is your net profit after tax. Okay, now you've got all the information that you require to work out the amount of taxation paid. Go for it. Your one minute starts now.
Welcome back, grade 12s. Let's see what you've got. Obviously, what you needed to see here and the fact that your SARS income tax appears under your current liabilities tells you that both these amounts are your liabilities at the end of the year. Remember what we alluded to early on in the segment where we said SARS income tax could either be an asset or a liability. But in this case here, both liabilities, so watch the step. Very simple, very simple. Opening balance. Now, why do I say opening balance? Because, yes, the love arrow. Beginning of the year, end of the year. Very important, right? Okay, beginning of the year, a credit balance of 8,700, so we slot it in, 8,700. End of the year, credit balance, 9,900, slot it in. Why? Above the line to be brought down on the credit side. Notice, I'm not putting in any details. This is a calculation. It's for you to understand what you are doing. There's my SARS income tax account. There's my opening balance. There's my closing balance. Okay, what do I now need? I now need my income tax for the year. What was my taxation for the year? It's not given to me directly, but I have my net profit before tax, and I have my net profit after tax. Surely, the difference between the two is my income tax. That's right. Okay, so what do I do? This is what I do. I say 1,279,000 minus... 895,300, and this will give me my income tax figure of 383,700. Okay, watch. 383,700. So what have I done? I've slotted in my opening balance. I've slotted in my closing balance. I've slotted my income tax, and now I can calculate the amount of taxation paid. Simple, guys. Watch this calculation. If you are showing this in exams, one of the ways in which you could show it was open a bracket, 383,700 plus 8,700 minus 9,900. Let's do that. So it's a 383,700 plus the 8,700 minus the 9,900 and voila, 382,500, I've got the amount of taxation paid. Clear, guys? Very simple. If you understand this and if you use this, I promise you, I promise you, you will never, ever go wrong in the exams. Right. The next thing that we needed to work out was, based on the question that we, we, we've been asked, Let's just get to the question. The net change in cash and cash equivalents. Right, once again, an easy way of understanding this. Let's get to the information first. Okay, there's my information with regards to cash and cash equivalents and not forgetting my overdraft so what method are we going to use? Once again, the magical T account, right? Step number one, opening balance. Let's find it. Remembering that's my beginning of the year and I had cash and cash equivalents of 54,750. Watch that figure closely. Cash and cash equivalents at the beginning of the year, 54,750. Watch what I do with it. 54,750. This is my cash and cash equivalents. Right. So that one is slotted in. But at the same time, what you need to note is that in this year, you also had an overdraft of 92,000 Rand. Okay? Now, the first question that you need to ask yourself, is that possible? And the answer is an emphatic yes. Why? Because 
It's possible that you have an overdraft, you're owing the bank money, and you may also have cash and cash equivalents in the form of patty cash, cash floats. So yes, this is the situation here now. Take the 92,000, let's slot it in, 92,000 as your overdraft. Can you see what I've done? For the, for the beginning of the year, I put in two. I put in my overdraft as well as my cash and cash equivalents. So this is a credit balance and that's my debit balance. Okay, next one. So beginning of the year is sorted. At the end of the year, what's my situation? I've got a cash and cash equivalents of 125,750, right? Okay, 125,750. Now you must be asking, why is it on the credit side? Because it's going to be brought down on the debit side, simple. Above the line, you're carried down in your brought down balance, simple. Now, what are, you, what are you determining? The net change in cash and cash equivalents. Here goes. This is what we're gonna do, okay? Let's take the 92,000. plus the one, two, five, one, two, five, seven, five, zero, one, two, five, seven, five, zero, is equal to that. Subtract your five, four, seven, five, zero, and your answer is 163,000. What is the 163,000? The 163,000 is your net change in cash and cash equivalents. Now, grade 12s, I'm appealing to you to understand what I've done here. Watch. Once again, cash and cash equivalents at the beginning of the year and an overdraft and cash and cash equivalents at the end of the year. This 163,000 is your net change in cash and cash equivalents. That's the amount by which your cash has increased. Okay, now, you will notice that at the end of the year you had only a favorable bank balance and there was no overdraft, okay? So therefore, if you redraft this, it would suffice for you to calculate your net change in cash and cash equivalents. Right, next part of the question. We are expected to calculate the financing activities in the cash flow statement. Okay, now, under financing, what do we have? We have proceeds of the shares that I sold, Right? Then you have the buyback of shares. And thirdly, you have your loan. Let's take the proceed first and see what information do we have. Okay, with regards to that, let's see what information we have here. Here goes. You are told that at the beginning of the year, you had 800,000 shares, right? You sold a further 200,000 shares and you sold it at eight rand each, eight rand per share. So very simple, guys. All that you do is a pretty uh, straightforward question here for you. All that you do is you take the number of shares that you sold, which was 200,000, and you multiply it by the value, you sold it at eight rand each, and clearly you would find your proceed to be 1,600,000. So that would now become your proceed 1,600,000. Okay, then, the next thing that you look at is you are told that 75,000 ordinary shares were repurchased from a retired shareholder at a total cost of 600. Now clearly, once they give you the total cost of 600,000, then there's absolutely nothing to calculate. So, total buyback, 
600,000. <coughs> Excuse me. Another important thing to remember is if that is not given to you, then what you have to do is you have to redraft your ordinary share capital account and your retained income account to find the two bank components. So be careful with this buyback. In this particular question, it is quite straightforward and there was nothing that you had to calculate because you were given both the price at which you issued the new shares, straightforward, and you were given the total cost of 600,000 for your buyback of your shares. Okay, guys, and the last thing that we have to calculate is the loan. And in order to do that, simple comparison of your loan. It was 2,750,000 is now 1,800,000. So therefore, let's do that. Okay, so all that we do is we take 2,750,000, one, two, three, minus 1,800,000, right? And that gives you a figure of 950,000. What's the 950,000? Very simple. The 950,000 is the loan that you repaid. Now be careful, that one is in the bracket because you repaid your loan. Remember our acronyms, we'll come to it after the break, the buyback in a bracket as well. In the meantime, during the break, guys, I want you to recall the German and French acronyms. Okay, so you've got some work to do during the break. See you just now. Welcome back, Germans and French. Let's see what you remember. Remember we spoke about this? in our lessons, and we're going to put it here for you. Let's see if you remember the German one, German one. A, I, U, L, I, G. What does that mean? When an asset increases in value, we are utilizing funds. It tells you that the figure has to be in a bracket to indicate an outflow of funds. Got it? When liabilities increase, we are Generating cash, we're getting in money. It's an inflow, it's a positive figure. So that's German. And what about the French? Okay, here goes. A, D, G, L, D, U. What does that mean? When an asset decreases in value, we are generating cash. There's, we, are, we are getting in the money. It's an inflow, positive. When a liability decreases, we are utilizing the funds. Okay, so please, a humble appeal to you, I implore you guys, make sure that you use your brackets correctly when you are doing a cash flow statement. Any outflow of cash must be shown in a bracket to indicate an outflow. Any inflow of cash, which is a positive, is shown without a bracket. Okay, let's move on. Calculate the following financial indicators, right? You have to calculate the return on every shareholder's equity, and you have to calculate the net asset value per share. Okay, we're going to give you, I think, two minutes to do this here, and we're going to give you the information that you need. Right? So let's just get you your information first. Okay, you're going to need this information here. All right. Okay. Go for it, guys. Your two minutes start now.
Welcome back, accounting boffins. Right, what do you need? You need your net profit after tax. So immediately, the financial indicator is return on every shareholder's equity. It's your net profit after tax over average shareholder's equity. And maybe we can just do it on this page here. It'll be easier for us since we're seeing we have the information here. Right, so it is my net profit after tax, which is 895,300. So you take your 895,300 over. Average tells you half of what? Of shareholders' equity. What? Beginning of the year, which is 614,200. 614,200. Plus, end of the year, shareholders' equity is 7166 7166 right? Okay, we're going to do this calculation. And if you do this calculation, you're going to get an answer because you want, it, you want the percentage return, so you're going to multiply it by 100 over 1, and obviously, if you do this calculation, you're going to get a percentage of 13.5%. Okay. Now, this question basically asked you just, it was application, pure application. But you needed to know the financial indicator. And that's where I want to come in now. Please make sure that when you walk into the exam room, you know your financial indicator indicators. Very, very important. As you can see, pure application. Right. The next financial indicator that you needed to calculate was your net asset value per share. Right. And in order to do that, it's your shareholders' equity, 7166850, over the number of issued shares. Now, do we know that? Let's see what information we have regarding the issued shares. I'm sure we have information. At the end of the financial year, there were 925,000 shares in issue. So clearly, you can see that. We've worked it out. Let's just go back. OK, we can work it out here. Oh, on the previous page, I think we've got it here. Okay, we can work it out here, it's fine. So what did we say? We want our 925,000 shares to work out the net asset value per share. It is your shareholders' equity divided by the number of issued shares. Let's just get the shareholders' equity figure. That was 7166850. 7166850. What's very important here as well, grade 12s, is you multiply this by 100 over 1, but not a percentage. Not a percentage. What you are calculating is your net asset. What is the value of the shares in cents? And let's just do this calculation so you can see it. It is 7166. 850 divided by 925,000, right, times 100. And you can see that's the value of your shares. Now, that's a net asset value per share, okay? 774 cents. Okay, now... Important that this answer is in sense. Okay, so we've done the pure application questions. The next question that we have to answer is, based on information that we are given, comment on the overall liquidity position of the company, quote, three relevant financial indicators with figures. Now, before we go on here, I'm going to give you one minute 
for you to identify for me. And let me put you onto that page so we have the information in front of us. I need that information so you can identify it. We must have that information by us. It's here, I'm sure we are. There it goes. Okay. You have one minute, grade 12s, to identify the liquidity ratios of the company. Go for it. Your minute starts now. Welcome back, grade 12s. Right, liquidity ratios. The current ratio is a liquidity ratio. My asset test ratio is a liquidity ratio. My stock holding period is a liquidity ratio. My debtors collection period is a liquidity ratio. And my creditors payment period is a liquidity ratio. In other words, when we're talking liquidity, we're talking about the ability of a company to settle its short term debts, liquidity. Right, how do we comment? Firstly, you can clearly see that we have an, a current ratio of 1,80 is to 1. In other words, for every 1 rand that we owe in, in current liabilities, we have 1 rand 80 available, so the company is liquid in terms of its meeting its obligations. Right? Now, comparison. Always do the comparison. What happened? There was an improvement in the financial indicator from the previous year. Watch. It was 1,70 is to 1, is now 1,80 is to 1. So you're going to state this in your paper. Quoting figures, stating what is happening. You mentioned the trend, you mentioned what is happening. Look at your asset test ratio. Your asset test ratio was 1,3 is to 1, is now 0, 0,9. So it decreased. Your current ratio increased, whereas your asset test ratio decreased. Next one, your stock holding period. Obviously, your stock holding period has decreased from 68 days to 52 days, which is a good thing. Why? You are selling your stock faster, you are converting the stock quicker into cash, and that's a good indicator. Right, look at your debtors collection period. Now, clearly, you can see you had a 30-day collection period, but this has now increased to 47 days. Is that good? Certainly not. Why? Your debtors are taking longer to settle their debts with you, and this means that you could encounter cash flow problems. Why am I saying that? Because if you look at the next indicator, which is your creditor's payment period, you're paying them within 30 days, which is a constant from last year to this year. So clearly, this could pose a challenge to you. Right. Then the question asked you to calculate your dividend payout policy. What I want you to see here is that in this year, you had a dividend of 112 cents and you paid out 40 cents. So watch this year. If you take 40 as your dividend over 112 times 100 over 1, let's do that. So we take comma 4 times 100 divided by 1, comma 1, 2 will give you a figure of 
35%. In other words, you had a dividend payout policy of 40 over 112. That was in the, in the one year. In the next year, you had 105 over 107 times 100 over 1. Once again, let's do our calculation here. It's 105 times 100 divided by 107, and my answer is 98%. Okay, now, notice that your dividend payout policy last year was 35%, and this year has increased to 98%. So clearly, there has been a shift in your dividend payout policy. Last year, you retained more. This year, you are giving more in the form of dividends. Please make sure you are off with this calculation, where you take your dividend over your earnings. Watch, dividends over earnings times 100 over 1 to express it as a percentage. Well, guys, unfortunately, the trip has come to an end. We are close to the moon. So from, the, from myself, Ashraf Patel, and my crew, James and Abi, until the next time, keep on shining, accounting, Shining stars. Be good. Bye-bye.